Good afternoon, and welcome to Washington College. I'm Professor George Spillich, and I have the honor this year to be the curator of the, Rush, of the Richard Holstein Ethics Program here at Washington College. It's my privilege to welcome you here to our talk today by Walter Schaub. But before I do so, I'd like to say a few words about the Holstein Ethics Program here at Washington College. This program was founded by our own Richard Holstein, the class of 1968. We are indebted to Dr. Holstein for his vision and his generosity in supporting the ethical development of our students. Very important to us. Washington College strives to create the next generation of leaders in our society, individuals who will have a strong and a positive impact upon their own lives, as well as the, as the lives of their family, their community, our nation, and the world. The development of a moral code is the basis for leading a life of purposeful action, and the goal of the Holstein program is to provide our students with a foundation for the development of that ethical code. We wish our students to lead a life of moral purpose. Now our namesake and the, namesake and the founder of our nation, General Washington said, I hope I shall possess firmness and virtue enough to maintain what I consider the most enviable of all titles, the character of an honest man. It is my privilege to introduce two honest men to you today. The first is Richard Holstein, who will introduce Mr. Schaub. Richard? Welcome everybody to our second decade of landmark ethics conversations. The heart and soul of a world-class liberal arts institution such as Washington College is its dedication to enabling its students critical thinking skills and moral compass. Everything we do has a consequence. It's imperative perhaps more at this time in history than most that we make intelligent decisions and take responsibility for them. The progress and survival of American democracy and society in general is proportional to the wise intervention of its citizens. The consequences of ethical behavior and moral compass are presented to us daily these days. They demand attention and action by all of us. Walter Schaub, Jr., former director of the United States Office of Government Ethics, joined Campaign Legal Center as senior director of ethics in July of 2017. In January of 2013, President Obama appointed Walter Schaub as director of the U.S. Office of Government Ethics, the OGE. He was sworn into office January 9, 2013, and announced on July 6, 2017, that he will resign from the position effective July 2017. Prior to his appointment, Schaub was Deputy General Counsel of OGE, a position he held since 2008. In addition, he served as a supervisory attorney at OGE from 2006 to 2008. From 2004 to 2006, he worked as an attorney with the law firm Shaw, Bransford, Villieux, and Roth, where he focused on federal employment law. Previously, Mr. Schaub served as a staff attorney at several federal agencies, including the OGE from 2001 to 2004, the Central Office of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs from 2000 to 2001, the Office of the General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 1998 to 2000, and the VA's Baltimore Washington Regional Counsel's Office from 1997 to 1998. He earned his BA degree from James Madison University and a JD from the American University Washington College of Law. I present with great pride Mr. Walter Schaub, Jr. Well, thanks for being here today, and thanks for that nice introduction. There's no doubt 
that our government is in, un, in an unprecedented ethics crisis these days. The problem is that there are so many unprecedented, shocking stories coming out of the government that sometimes it feels like news is coming to us out of a fire hose. A story that would have been on the front page of the newspaper for weeks uh, barely gets any notice as it's overtaken by one shocking story after another. And as a result, sometimes the ethics news gets drowned out by some of the even more dramatic events. But the ethics crisis in our government is something we should be paying attention to because it goes to the very heart of the legitimacy of our government. Our leaders work for us and it's their responsibility to demonstrate to us that they're using the power we entrust to them solely for our benefit and not for their own benefit. Now, our first hint of the coming ethics crisis was when President Trump refused to release his tax returns during the presidential election, as every other presidential candidate did and had done for a great many years. Things started getting strange very quickly after the election as well. On November 14th, just about a week after the election, he had a call with the Argentine president. And during that call, he reportedly dis used that as an opportunity to discuss with the Argentine president some permits that had stalled on projects he was working on in Buenos Aires. Now, they both deny that that happened, but the, there's no getting around the fact that the developer of the project in Buenos Aires is the one who set up the call, and that all of a sudden, three days after the call, Trump's permits came through. On that same day that they came through, we also saw Ivanka Trump on television sitting with the president as they were talking to the Japanese prime minister at a time when she was negotiating with a Japanese company in which the Japanese government is a major shareholder. So right from the start, you had a blending of government and business. Then on November 23rd, Trump gave an interview to the New York Times that included a, a number of strange and unnerving statements, but one of them really stood out. <clears throat> it was the statement that the law is totally on my side, meaning the president can't have a conflict of interest. <clears throat> That's a really telling statement. Those are not the words of a statesman who has embraced the ethical responsibilities of high office. The very idea of having a side in an ethics issue like that is antithetical to the very concept of public service. Compare that statement, the law is totally on my side, with the concept of public service as a public trust, which is the core principle of the government ethics program. And the other half of that statement was equally unsupportable, the idea that a president cannot have a conflict of interest. A conflict of interest is anything that gives you an incentive to put your interests before the interests of the people you represent. So obviously anyone can have a conflict of interest, including the president. What would have been accurate for him to say is that the law simply doesn't prescribe criminal penalties for his conflicts of interest the way it does for other government officials. But that statement was a clue to his sense that the government exists for the benefit of the president. And we've seen that play out in things like the recent reporting on his comments about Amazon, a major American business and employer, but he's attacking it and making absolutely strange claims about somehow it's a burden on the post office when it's one of the post office's biggest and most important customers and is what part of what's keeping the post office even afloat. But he's attacking Amazon because Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos, happens to own the Washington Post and the president happens to dislike the Washington Post reporting on the ethics scandals and other problems coming out of his administration. And so he's perverting government authority to attack his personal opponents rather than focusing on the interests of the country. He promised to hold a hearing. Uh, at the end of November, he promised to hold a news conference, I mean, on December 15th to talk about his conflicts of interest and what he was gonna do about them. <clears throat> but he wound up postponing that until January, and it became clear he really had no plan for what he would do if he won the election. Ethics was merely an afterthought. So on January 11th, when he finally held the press conference, he stood up in front of a mountain 
of folders and papers that he pretended were the documents associated with this bogus trust that he created for his financial interests. But there was nothing in those documents. Those were blank folders and blank pieces of paper, we later learned, and it was all a Hollywood stunt. In reality, the entire arrangement itself was also empty and meaningless because the conflict of interest stems from your interest in the companies, your holding of the company, the benefit that you're gonna get from the company, not who runs the company. And so as a result, he retained those financial interests and remained mired in conflicts of interest. Now, along that same period of time, the Office of Government Ethics, which I was leading, was plugging away at trying to help him get his nominees into government and get them set up so that he could get his players on the field and start pursuing his agenda. We were encountering nominees that were increasingly difficult to work with. Not all of them, some of them were fine individuals and we enjoyed working with them, but many of them questioned why they had to take the hard steps that ethics requires as they come into government, pointing to the fact that their boss didn't have to do it, so why should they? And that's actually a fair question. Why would he hold himself to a lower standard than the people he's bringing into office? After all, Wilbur Ross and Rex Tillerson were rich too, but they were willing to sacrifice for public service and sell off conflicting financial interests, unlike their boss. And so in that environment, we saw on February 9th, Kellyanne Conway stand up in front of the camera in the White House at the, in the Brady Press Briefing Office, and she looked right into the camera and said this, go buy Ivanka stuff is what I would tell you. I'm going to give a free commercial here. Go buy it today, everybody. And so here's one of his top appointees using governmental authority to promote a product. And it's not hypothetical. They later did an analysis of sales and discovered that sales skyrocketed in early, in early February. And the biggest jump occurred on the day that she said that, February 9th. The sales jumped 219% over the prior day. So OGE asked the White House to look into the matter because any lower level official who did that would face very serious consequences in terms of disciplinary action. The White House not only didn't take action against her, but escalated by attacking the Office of Government Ethics and questioning its authority, saying it had no authority over the agencies in the executive office of the president. There's about a, a dozen agencies in there. And that the regulations didn't apply to high level officials. So once again, it's that theme that the lower you are, the more rules apply to you. And the higher you are, and the more power we entrust to you, the less the rules apply to you. That was really disturbing, and it only got worse later that fall, uh, that spring, in the late spring. Um, I had been hearing news reports about these secret waivers they were supposedly giving to top appointees in the government, and the waivers were saying, you don't have to comply with this ethics rule, or you don't have to comply with that ethics rule. Well, as the head of the government-wide ethics program, it was my job to know how waivers were being used. And I asked them for them, and they didn't turn them over. So I issued a data call instructing all of the government to turn over the waivers that they had uh, issued. And I set the time period for an entire year because I wanted to see how the last administration was doing them, too. I was concerned that maybe they slacked off at the end and were casually issuing waivers. So the, the two-thirds of the time period covered was actually focused on the last administration, and when we did get some information, we criticized them for some mistakes they made. But the um, White House let us know they had no intention of complying with this rule. And they were telling us that verbally for a while, and then they had the head of the White House Budget Office, Mick Mulvaney, send us a letter. And he didn't just send us a letter, he decided to copy every general counsel in every agency in the government and every lead ethics official in every agency in the government, a total of about three or 400 individuals. And in that letter, he told us he doubted that OGE had authority to collect ethics records from anywhere in the government, which means they had now escalated from saying the small number of small agencies in the executive office of the president were exempt from ethics to all agencies are exempt from ethics. And this presented actually an existential threat to the ethics program because 
Most of the employees I had there at OGE spent all day, every day, collecting ethics documents and reviewing them. And so if suddenly they couldn't collect any ethics documents from anywhere in the entire government, there's nothing left to look at, I might as well send them all home and shut down the shop. So my staff and I worked through the weekend and long hours to put together a detailed response that went into the history of how the government had always complied with these, including every past White House in both Democratic and Republican administrations, all the way back to when the Ethics and Government Act first created the Office of Government Ethics. That was 400 pages of attachments to that 10-page letter. And we filed off that basically ream of paper with Mick Mulvaney. Uh, and then I started packing up the remaining ob objects in my office because I figured I'd be fired. Uh, but at least I had gone down fighting for my agency. And a friend of mine who's a reporter said that his publication actually wrote the story about me being fired, figuring they'd just throw in the last few details when it actually happened. Um, and in fact, at the time, the president was in Saudi Arabia, um, and we got word that the White House counsel had called over there for guidance on something. Uh, we suspected they were asking for permission to announce that I'd been fired. But in fact, it didn't happen, and they wound up caving, and at the last second, uh, the, on the, at the deadline, they wound up releasing these waivers. And <laughs> When I got them, that was a fairly big victory for the Office of Government Ethics. We had survived this attack and, and we're now still in possession of our power to collect ethics documents. But when I saw the waivers, I suddenly realized the secret of the secret waivers is that there were no secret waivers. They had never gotten around to issuing them and it was apparent that they had ginned them up that day. They had sent us a stack of mostly unsigned, undated, retroactive documents. Now, if you think about what a waiver is, a waiver is saying you can go ahead and ignore this ethics rule. If you need a retroactive waiver, it means you went ahead and, and ignored an ethics rule before you were told you could do it. Uh, and so they were papering over violations. And at that point, I knew that this group was capable of doing anything. Um, and what started happening was they were adapting to my strategy of making public what was going on by just simply cutting us off from information. The problem was we had an obligation to review White House financial disclosure reports to see what conflicts of interest White House staff might have. And so if they're not telling us what these people do for a living, and if they're not asking us, answering our questions about the financial interests they had disclosed, we had no ability to effectively analyze whether they had conflicts of interest. So I knew that I couldn't become window dressing for corruption by just signing all of these reports saying there are no conflicts of interest here when I didn't know that to be true. But I was in a tough spot because I also couldn't refuse on a blanket basis to sign any White House financial disclosure reports. That would be a dramatic escalation and they would have claimed it was completely partisan, which is their standard move whenever anybody questions anything at all that they do, suddenly they claim it's partisan. So I couldn't sign the forms, I couldn't reject the forms, I had just come off this experience with the waiver, and I decided that I needed to get attention for the ethics program so people would understand the extent of the crisis. The problem is, back when I was fighting those waivers and trying to get the waivers, I'd gone to some reporters to try to get them to cover the story uh, to create pressure on them to release these waivers. And with a lot of effort, I had succeeded somewhat in getting some attention but I had reporters explain to me that even though this would have been a major scandal in any past administration, uh, it barely would make the news, much less the front page, because there was so much dramatic, shocking, unprecedented news that very week that would drown it out. And so I was aware that we were really struggling on a lot of fronts to get people to be aware of what was going on, and I thought the best thing I could do at that point was it was clear to me I couldn't achieve any more in that job and I wanted to draw attention to the ethics crisis. And so at that point I resigned, which was the hardest thing I ever had to do. But it was worth it because the ethics program matters. It's absolutely imperative that we have a strong government ethics program. Our public officials are not supposed to come to Washington and profit from their public service except through the salary we choose to pay them. And there shouldn't be perks for high office. 
and conflicts of interest shouldn't influence their decision making. But that's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, the president, since he took over, has applied himself with gusto to monetizing the presidency. Right after the election, he doubled the membership fee at his resort down at Mar-a-Lago. And he's made frequent visits to that property and others. Each one of those visits is an advertisement for the properties because the reporters and the news crew and the, the entire entourage of the presidency has to go with him. And because of that, those trips are very expensive. Uh, in fact, he has now spent about a fourth of his days in office, just shy of that, at a golf course that he owns. One fourth of the days in office. And that amounts to almost, I mean, the numbers are very difficult to calculate, but when they add up the cost of flying Air Force One and getting the security detail down there and getting you know, the football where they have the nuclear codes and the staff down there, they estimate that that may be as much as $100 million. Now, the Office of Government Ethics annual budget was $16 million, so we could have had more than five more offices of government ethics and still had money left over for him to take a few vacations on our dime. And some of that money goes right into his pocket. We discovered last fall that the Secret Service had paid him, by mid-fall, $150,000 just to ride around in his golf carts to protect him. He couldn't give them a frequent flyer discount for those. They had to pay full price. And he actively makes private endorsements, telling people of books he likes or TV shows he likes or telling you, go buy Eddie Bauer because they supported my campaign. When he was on TV talking about the human tragedy in a hurricane-ravaged region, he was sporting a cap that he's selling on his website for $45. And he has violated the law by slapping the presidential seal on mugs and shot glasses and other tchotchkes to demean the presidency and make a fast buck, including ordering plaques with the seal to put on the White House. Businesses, charities, politicians, and even foreign governments have been trying to curry favor with him by renting his properties, particularly the Trump International Hotel, at above market prices. So extra premium that you're paying to have access to the president. But even more troubling are the questions about conflicts of interest. We can't know whether his decisions are being made on the basis of his stated policy aims or for private profit. He's praised autocratic abuses by leaders like Erdogan, Duterte, and Xi, but we find out that he's got properties in Turkey, the Philippines, and China, and that increases the question about whether is he doing that because he truly admires dictators, or is he doing that because he's got financial interests there? Even domestically, he announces a new policy that we're going to start offshore drilling on the coast of America again, and before the notice and comment period closes, Secretary Zinke, the head of the interior, makes an exception for Mar-a-Lago citing, I mean, <laughs> Florida, citing local voices, one of which is probably Mar-a-Lago. Uh, other governors then chime in saying, well, where's our exemption? Well, I guess what they need to do is get a Trump property on the seashore in a hurry. Um, the, the thing is, it's the burden's on him not us, to convince us that these financial interests are not creating a, an incentive for him. Every past president understood that they shouldn't be held to a lower standard than the people who work for them, and that they should convince the American people that their decisions are on the up and up, so they would divest their financial interests. That's every president since the enactment of the Ethics in Government Act. But instead of divesting, and instead of saying, well, I'm keeping them, so I'm going to go overboard and be extra transparent, he still refuses to release his tax returns, and his companies are layers upon layers of shell companies. I'm the one who signed his financial disclosure report, and I can't tell you who he's in business with or who his businesses owe money to or who they're dependent on for their sales. And that's because the financial disclosure laws don't require that but they kind of are based on an assumption that the people filling them out are going to divest their conflicting financial interests. The administration also has across the board been fighting Freedom of Information Act requests, and more of them have to go into litigation than before because they are not being transparent and not answering questions about their financial, um, you know, the, the financial interests of our leaders. Even his customers are creating LLCs, limited liability companies, so that you won't know the names of his customers. So it's impossible to get in there. 
And the situation's made worse by the nepotism in the White House. It's illegal to engage in nepotism in the government. 2.7 million federal employees are subject to a nepotism law and will be fired if they engage in it. And for 50 years, the Department of Justice thought that law had applied to the White House. Shortly after noon on January 20th, 2017, they issued an opinion reversing four prior opinions in which they told presidents they couldn't hire family members in the White House so that Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump could come into the White House. And we've seen predictable problems stemming from that, including the ripple effect they've had on the security clearance process because Jared is having trouble getting a clearance and that makes them reluctant to deny clearances to others for fear that they'd embarrass the president's son-in-law. And so you had 130 people being carried on interim clearances where normally you'd reach a point where it's you get a full-time permanent clearance or you get fired. But these people are being carried on interim clearances. And Jared and Ivanka were not required to sell off conflicting financial interests the way White House appointees normally are. And that's significant because we're not talking about holdings like just publicly traded stock that you buy in a, in a publicly traded company. We're talking about large real estate projects. You can't just go and get a mortgage to build a billion dollar skyscraper. So you are completely dependent on large investments and frequent infusions of cash. That has left a senior appointee to the president, senior assistant to the president, vulnerable to foreign interference. And our intelligence agencies have caught at least four separate countries plotting on ways they could use those interests to influence him. Questions have been raised about national security involving uh, a number of other places, including Qatar, where suddenly the United States turns on this strategic ally that we've supported for a long time and support a blockade of that country Coincidentally, two weeks after the Kushner family reportedly failed to get loans from the Qataris that would support their, their cash-strapped businesses and real estate projects. There's been problems with domestic conflicts of interest, too. There was the report of the meeting where Jared Kushner is sitting in the White House across the table from major lenders from whom his family were seeking millions and millions and millions of dollars in loans from. Uh, at the time that he was sitting across from them. Now, can we draw a direct link between any of these actions and, and the outcome? Well, no, you can't with conflicts of interest because there isn't enough transparency. You can't know what a government official is working on. That information's just not out there, and the White House is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So if they don't choose to tell you, you can't know. And even when we do know, these issues are very complex, include a lot of competing factors. But the thing is, we shouldn't even have to ask. The normal way we deal with conflicts of interest is to say, if you have a financial interest in a matter, you should not participate in it. We're not gonna bring out the brain reader and try to figure out what actually motivated you. We're gonna say you can't participate if you have that financial interest. That's what Congress has said in the law that is applicable to everybody other than the president. The problem is it isn't applicable to him and he is engaging in a number of matters and we can't know for sure what's motivating them. But again, these government officials work for us. They're representing us. And in a representative democracy, if our leaders are serving themselves, they're not serving us. And so the burden is on them not only to not have a conflict of interest, but to demonstrate that they don't have a conflict of interest. Not the other way around where we say, we're gonna give you massive amounts of power and you'll tell us if you do anything wrong. And this bad behavior at the top has had a trickle down effect. We've seen excesses among the cabinet that are extremely unusual. Uh, we had Tom Price, the head of HHS, and David Shulkin, the head of VA, already fired for flitting around on private jets and, la and lavish what are essentially vacations on the taxpayer dime. But how can they really be faulted when all they're doing is emulating what their boss does? And now Secretary Pruitt of the EPA is under fire because he likes to fly first class, and he spent $45,000 building a Maxwell Smart cone style cone of silence in his office. And he's rented property from a lobbyist where he stayed possibly at below market rates. That has to be analyzed. But the issue is 
what would make you think that it's great to go stay at a lobbyist whose firm lobbies your agency? And he used a staffer to help get that, which is a misuse of position if he really did it. Get, you know, the reporting says he used a staffer to send her out to go do it. And then he used an illegal authority, uh, he illegally used a hiring authority to move her into a position that paid more. So this 26 year old is making a six figure salary now. You got Ben Carson with his $31,000 dining room table like he's a French noble from before the revolution. Or Zinke mixing politics and business, flying $12,000 on a charter plane when he could have paid $300 commercial, and allowing a political party to charge donors at a fundraiser more to pose for pictures with the Secretary of Interior. Now, that's got a very unusual fan base, I'm sure, but nevertheless, <laughs> You shouldn't be using your government position that way. There's also the Hatch Act, which prohibits the misuse of government position uh, to ad advocate for or against a, pre a candidate for political office in a partisan election. And three White House officials have already been found guilty, Dan Scavino, Nikki Haley, and Kellyanne Conway. Well, technically Nikki Haley's not in the White House, but three top presidential appointees. And Jared Kushner and Zinke are also under investigation and possibly others because complaints are being filed regularly. But these are just a few of the examples. I could go on. I think you get the picture of what the effect, the ripple effect has been on the rest of the, the appointees. And what we've learned in the first year of this administration is that there are gaps in an ethics program that always worked under presidents of both parties who actively supported the program, uh, but it has gaps that can't survive when a president doesn't support that program. For instance, there are no inspectors general in small agencies or the White House, so there's no one to conduct investigations. The Office of Government Ethics doesn't have investigative authority, and agency managers can take disciplinary action against people, but they have to want to. And if they don't want to, OGE's remedy is to write to the president. But what if the president doesn't care? We had that happen with Kellyanne Conway. She has now been found guilty of three different ethics violations by two different federal agencies. And one of those agencies was headed by a Trump appointee who came into the government from a conservative organization. And six months prior to his finding, the White House was telling the Senate that he walked on water and they should definitely confirm him until he found against them, and then suddenly he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so there was absolutely no disciplinary action for this recidivist. Um, and that tells us something. It tells us you can have laws on the books, but they're nothing more than words on a page if somebody won't enforce them. Now, some people have been talking about getting new laws, but the reality is we wouldn't need new laws if we had a president enforcing the ethics rule or a Congress that was willing to conduct oversight why didn't they hold a hearing, not on Kellyanne Conway, but on the White House, trying to find out why the White House refused to take action against her when there were findings on three occasions by two different agencies? And we've had Congress stand idly by despite requests for hearings to discover the, the, what these conflicts of interest are doing. Uh, we recently had the head of Congress's most important investigative committee, the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, uh, Trey Gowdy, who I have found to be a fairly level-headed guy in a lot of ways, and he's certainly very smart. He is Congress's lead investigator, and he went on TV this past week to tell us that he's concluded that congressional investigations really don't work and you can't achieve anything with them. Despite the fact that he led the Benghazi hearing and grilled the president's political rival for 11 hours on national television, I will tell you, I would not have the stamina to go through an 11 hour grilling by somebody as smart as Trey Gowdy. Um, so I don't know why suddenly the loss of interest in holding congressional hearings. You had Chuck Grassley, who's normally a reliable, good government guy who's always looking to investigate people in the government for what he perceives as wrongdoing one way or the other. But this past year, he was posting pictures of Instagram, giddily smiling into the camera from the Trump International Hotel and holding up a picture of the menu and pointing where it said Trump wines and Trump steak and Trump bologna. Um, okay, I made that last one up. Um, and Grassley is still more focused on investigating Trump's political rival who hasn't been in government for five years, lost an election, and is not coming back from this one. 
but he's convinced that he needs to investigate that and has no interest in investigating what's going on now. And he and Lindsey Graham joined together to, refer, to refer Christopher Steele for criminal investigation uh, because he's more interested in going after the people who would investigate the president, which is why there's now this concerted effort to tear down the FBI. Uh, you've got Ron Johnson walking around talking about magic secret societies with aluminum foil helmets inside the FBI. Uh, I jokingly uh, said to somebody that I, I wonder if I need to confess to our Harry Potter book club in the early 2000s at the Office of Government Ethics, because that's about as close to a secret society as you're going to get in the government. <laughs> now, when I say I'm not sure that laws, new laws are the answer, I don't mean that there's no room for new laws. I've actually proposed 13 legislative changes that would strengthen the ethics program, and I actually met with Trey Gowdy and his Democratic counterpart, Elijah Cummings, to present these. But again, we wouldn't need new laws if we had a president who cared about ethics or a Congress that cared about government oversight. What we need is leaders who embrace government ethics and subscribe to a set of ethical principles. And so what's to be done is we need to demand this of our leaders. And they're only going to listen if it's a credible threat, because what they care about is the threat of losing. Now, I'm not naive enough in a polarized society like ours has become to think that anybody's going to change political parties over conflict of interest concerns. But I think the answer then is to push the question further back in the process when a party is still trying to select a candidate. Imagine if they had started asking about conflicts of interest when Trump was still on the stage with Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush and John Kasich and Ben Carson and a half a dozen others. And he said, I'm not going to actually do anything about my conflicts of interest. A president can't have conflicts of interest, but I'm going to spend a fourth of my time at my golf courses and I'm going to slap the presidential seal on shot glasses and sell them to the public. That would not have been a very good debate for him. Uh, because the others would have pounced on him. And the reaction and the effect on the polls would have done one of two things. It would have either persuaded him to change his position and say, gee, you know what, maybe I will do something about those conflicts of interest. Or it would have led his voters to switch to vote for Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or one of the others. And it's the same on the other side. Nobody there is going to suddenly vote for Donald Trump. But if you're raising the questions at the time when people can afford to care about government ethics at a point where it doesn't cost them their allegiance to their political party, I think they may be more open to listening and you can get through some of the resistance. Well, even now, we have some very wealthy people on both sides of the aisle toying with the idea of running for office, either primarying Trump on the Republican side or running against him on the Democratic side. I haven't heard one of them say, and my key platform would be resolving conflicts of interest. And so I think that's what we need to do is be asking people like that, whichever party they are, what are you going to do about your conflicts of interest? And what, what will be your method of supporting the ethics program in government? How will you get us out of this ethics crisis and restore it? And force them to answer those questions before primaries and before even in other elections, like congressional elections, before uh, they secure their party's nomination, asking them, are you willing to do some government oversight? Because ethics isn't a partisan issue. We have seen that both under uh, both parties' administrations in the White Houses, they have always supported the ethics program. I myself worked both under George Bush and Barack Obama, and I have to report out that I had terrific experiences dealing with both of their White Houses in terms of their support for the Office of Government Ethics and the Ethics Program. That has traditionally never been a partisan issue. And so we've got to re-inject it the only way we can, which is when people can evaluate candidates and choose a different one without having to abandon their party. And that means raising the question early, and that's now. So I'll close by challenging you to demand ethics in government. This Congress isn't going to change the laws right now, and even if they did, I don't think it would get to the heart of things. This is on us to do something, and the only thing we can do is actually hold leaders accountable and candidates accountable for committing to government ethics. So whichever political party you support, start talking internally about 
which candidate is actually gonna prioritize government ethics and pose those hard questions to them, whether it's on TV or in town hall meetings where regular people like us get to show up and ask them questions. Uh, but we've got to make sure that our leaders actually support government ethics because you can have all the laws on the books you want, but the tone from the top is gonna to affect how people behave and the willingness of, of our leaders to actually impose consequences for ethical failures is gonna depend on their belief that that's crucial to getting reelected. So thank you for hearing me out today and I'm happy to take a few questions. Uh, how are we doing the questions? Is there a microphone or do I just point or? All right, just point. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. So I'll repeat the question just so that anybody who couldn't hear. She asked, what's been happening at the Office of Government Ethics since I left? A number of things have been happening. Um, my term was due to end at the end of last year. So I, there's no way I'd still be in that job now, even if I had stayed. Um, and so I had been planning long before I knew I had to quit thinking, well, even if I stayed through 2017, instead of leaving a few months early, um, I needed to plan for what was next. And so I picked a deputy who is incredibly serious about government ethics. Her name is Shelley Finlayson. And after I left, the, I had put processes in place where she was the acting director, and that lasted for a total of two days till they swooped in and promoted my uh, general counsel, who, was dealing with them for six months in ways that I didn't know about, uh, and who has done a lot to, um, in my view, cut them some free passes. The worst of them, and actually the very worst thing that has happened, uh, was that last month, uh, he approved a legal defense fund for them that allows them to pay people's legal fees uh, in connection with the Russia investigation, and I don't actually think legal defense funds are a terrible thing. Um, I myself had a congressman come after me once, and that was a scary thing. Uh, and so I'm sympathetic that people going into public service shouldn't lose their life savings because they get caught up in somebody uh, coming after them, uh, fairly or unfairly. And, um, but OGE has always worked for 30 years to make sure that those legal defense funds were set up in ways that complied with the law and put mechanisms in place that would prevent violations of law. This thing is the loosiest goosey thing I've ever seen and it's devilishly clever in a number of ways. Um, but the key thing about it, and, and I see his fingerprints all over it in terms of some of the wording in it, um, but the key thing is that it, it's not set up for one person. In the past, a legal defense fund was a trust you would set up and there'd be a trustee and the trust instrument would say, any money that comes to this can only go to you. It can't go to anybody else. And in the unlikely event that there's anything left over, and there won't be because legal fees are insane, um, it'll go to a charity of the trustee's choosing, not even your choosing. And the trustee will make sure that you don't get money from people who will be affected by your agency's work. Uh, so that we know that they're not trying to influence you. This trust allows money from any source it wants and pays some lip service to the idea that money won't come to you personally if the money's from somebody who can be affected by your agency, but there's no mechanism in place to really ensure that. And more importantly, it lets the funds manager, because it's not set up as a trust, it's set up as a political organization like these political PACs out there, lets this funds manager pick and choose which of you. And the crowd of people who are eligible for it are bigger than the crowd of people in this room. And so I get to pick and choose which ones that I give to. So there's a real danger that if you're sitting there terrified that getting interviewed by Mueller or by a congressional investigation is gonna bankrupt you, you're worried that if you testify in a way that the president doesn't like, it could hurt your chances of getting the money. And in fact, the fund manager is prohibited from talking to any of you, but it's allowed to talk to the Trump campaign. So there can be these back and forth with the Trump re-election campaign, which could say, give to this guy, don't give to that guy. And then it could pick and choose. So we may start seeing a pattern where anybody who flips 
and testifies honestly about what they saw, suddenly is cut off from any money and, any, and, and goes bankrupt, potentially. But anybody who stays silent or says what we like to hear can get money. And to me, the fact that the Office of Government Ethics sent out a letter saying that this thing is fine and it complies with law is the absolute worst thing it's done in 40 years of existence. It's shocking and frankly heartbreaking to see something so corrupt come out of that office. What I will say is good news is they surprised all of us by nominating somebody who's a decent guy. They picked one of my other employees and said that they're gonna nominate him and he's somebody who worked in the Bush administration White House and I had dealt with him when I was Deputy General Counsel at OGE and he was in the Bush administration. I've seen him for years working and know that he's an honorable person who would not engage in this kind of horseplay where, where the current acting director bless this. So keep your fingers crossed on a congressional hearing this month and hopefully he'll get confirmed and it'll put something of an end, although I don't know that they won't keep working with this general counsel behind his back as they did to me. So the prognosis is not great, but, uh, but that's where things stand. Mm. So his questions about uh, VA Secretary Shulkin, who was recently fired, and the, the public story is that it was because of the ethics scandals, but Shulkin is telling the world it was because he was opposed to outsourcing the VA. Uh, as a former VA employee, I would be horrified to see VA outsourced. I, I, I really cared about the veterans when I worked there and the people I worked with did too. Um, but. I haven't seen Shulkin accept any responsibility for his actions. And that IG report was one of the most scathing reports I've ever seen about a cabinet official, and his behavior was just terrible. Now, I said that on TV one time, and it got him so mad he called and yelled at me for 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, and uh, it just was disappointing to see that he sees no um, uh, culpability on his part. Now, I think what I'd say about that is both things can be true. It can be true that he behaved badly and did not uphold the ethical responsibilities of the office, and it can be true that he was done in because he has policy views that are opposed to those who are making decisions. Um, but I don't think that it's a good thing to give people free passes because you agree with them. I think that's what's happening in the Trump administration. There are people who like policies that he's pursuing or like him personally, uh, and so they'll ignore stuff that not only hypothetically would they oppose to, but we know they're opposed to it because they were chanting, lock her up. Um, and so there are things that don't match up uh, in that posture of saying, my guy can do anything, but I'm opposed to ethics problems when it's the other guy. And I think the flip side of that is um, with David Shulkin, you know, while he was yelling at me, I told him I wasn't part of any political plot, that in actuality I liked his policies better than I thought whoever would succeed him uh, would bring to the table, but that I cared about the ethics program, and I think the ethics program simply has to matter. And so I campaigned for his removal because what he did was wrong. Now, I think actually his claim is undercut a little bit because if there was some massive conspiracy to replace him with some person who was trying to gut the VA, the president wouldn't have looked around and just picked his own personal physician uh, <laughs> who's never been anything but an individual doctor and is now gonna run an agency with a $200 billion budget. You know, the former head of Procter and Gamble 
uh, was the last VA secretary, and he had the experience of leading about 40,000 employees for years, and he found it difficult to run a place with 200, actually 377,000 employees. So I don't know how a guy who's never had any employees is gonna run a place, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that when a cabinet official does what Shulkin did, the ethics program has to matter, and we have to prioritize that and not say, well, I like the guy, so I'm gonna cut him a free pass on ethics, because I think that's what got us into this fix. Jim, I was gonna ask about what do you think about the idea, like, focus on, on the CEO, like, giving him here? Sure, I'll answer that, and then I wanna be sure to get to some other people, but the follow-up question is, what do I think about people putting him on uh, for what, what you perceive as trying to get TV ratings? Uh, I don't think that's what they're doing. I think it's a legitimate news story. People want to hear it. And we have to leave open the possibility that I'm wrong. Um, I know our president's never wrong, but I'm wrong sometimes. Um, and it could be that there's some massive, terrible conspiracy. And I think the public needs the opportunity to hear what he says to judge for themselves. So I don't think it's just for ratings that he's been put on TV. Yeah, the question is what advice would I give to the dedicated career ethics officials in government? Uh, and they are so important. They are really uh, performing an important role and they're performing under a lot of pressure. Now the good news is inside some of the agencies, particularly the really large agencies with a lot of mechanisms overlaying one another like inspectors general and offices that audit procurements and things like that, a lot is still going right. Um, I think the bad tone from the top has trickled down to the political level. I don't think it's trickled all the way down. I think it will eventually, but if it continues, but it hasn't yet. And so I think a lot of the ethics officials, their day-to-day -day lives in many ways are still fairly normal, except for the folks at the top who are dealing either with the White House or the, the political appointees in their agencies. Um, and my advice to them, which I have given them, is do what you always do. And don't start grading them on a curve. You have always applied certain standards and you're always gonna apply them. And I did that while I was in the job too. I've said that before and after. In the job I was working with one nominee and his agency's ethics official was all of a sudden encouraging us to cut lots of breaks for this guy. And the way it works when you're processing a nominee is both the agency's ethics officials and OGE is involved. And I, and, I, and I called him separately and really just had a long talk with him about how I know you're scared of this guy and I know that current times have you rattled, but you did not give his predecessor this free pass and you need to do what you've always done. Uh, and at least while I was there, I told him, blame me. Well, the truth is, OG has always said, blame OGE, make OGE the bad guy. And that's part of the value in having the Office of Government Ethics is the ethics officials work for these political appointees at their agencies. Uh, but the Office of Government Ethics is a separate agency. And so it's in a very safe position to play the bad guy. And so what I'd say to you is make OGE the bad guy and talk about OGE's guidance and OGE's rules, but tell people these rules have to happen. And I think some of these bad actors are making it easier for them. Because now these ethics officials can say, do you want to go the way Shulkin did? Did you want to go the way Pruitt did? Maybe, or not Pruitt, Pruitt hasn't gone yet. <laughs> Price, I meant. Uh, next month I'll be able to say Pruitt. Um, but, um, but there are consequences. And even if you don't believe that they were really fired over the ethics issues and, and instead think the ethics issues were the excuse for firing them, if you do this and you violate a rule, you'll be serving yourself up on a platter and they can use that as an excuse the first time they wanna get rid of you. And so I think the ethics officials have a lot of tools in their tool belt and a lot of arsenal, you know, a lot of um, examples they can give right now. Uh, but you know, for those who are dealing with some of these bad actors, um, uh, it's tough. And I saw that um, the, the ethics official over at HUD in Ben Carson's office wrote a very tough email or memo saying that 
this kind of stuff is unacceptable. And I was really just filled with a moment of pride that one of our ethics officials had stood up and done the right thing under very scary circumstances. Now, one thing that a lot of them have going for them is that they're retirement eligible now. And so <laughs> they can take a bit of a risk and, and know that they could leave if they needed to. Um, but that's not true of all of them. So, any others? <laughs> yeah, the president can fire the head of OGE um, in a tweet if he wants. Um, and I was, I, and I literally thought on two occasions that I was definitely going to be fired. Um, and the truth is, <laughs> it would have been a relief. Um, <laughs> But I also had come up with this policy that I was going to not on purposely do things to get fired, even though that would be the easy way out, um, and really try to thread that difficult needle of trying to work with them on the days they were reasonable. And there were days when we came to agreement on individual things, um, and so I was in there still working with them. But the, the president can fire the head of OGE for any reason or for no reason whatsoever. Um, now, the career people, that gets tougher because they've got appeal rights and the president can't fire them directly. What the president can do is put somebody in the job and pressure them to fire them. But even if they do, they'll have certain appeal rights to a board that has to review that. The problem is there are many in Congress who are trying to gut those appeal rights. And the reason that scares me um, is because these protections were put in for civil servants to make sure that the functions of government that are supposed to be carried out objectively, I mean, there are some that are supposed to be political, but some are supposed to be objective. Um, those are in place so that politicals can't manipulate the system. And, you know, for instance, the president has called for investigating his vanquished political rival. Well, that's the stuff of banana republics. Um, and similarly, though, he's declared in his State of the Union address that he wants a purge of the career civil service. And he recently weighed in on a personnel action against Andy McCabe. Now, I don't know Andy McCabe personally, and I don't know what the IG found, and I've worked with that IG before and have a great deal of respect for him, so I don't have an opinion on whether he may be guilty or not. But what I do have an opinion on is that the personnel action is hopelessly tainted by a political president interfering in a career decision that's supposed to be made based on the merit systems principles. And so my concern going forward is that right now, the president can't just fire career OGE employees. But if Congress rolls back the civil service protections, this isn't about you know, getting rid of, of bad employees. This is about getting rid of the protections that keeps the government from becoming the personal weapon of whoever is in charge. Uh, and that actually, as far as I'm concerned, is part of the ethics program, these merit systems principles that protect career feds for that very reason. Uh, so that's, that was a good question. At this point, I'd like to invite you all to a reception out back and to a private conversation. Mr. Shaw, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, good, thanks. Good, good, thank you very much. I'm just gonna grab my bag so I don't forget it.